to a podcast from the Irish Linen Centre and Lisbon Museum. Today we're speaking to Dr. Sarah Doherty and her work on everyday life in ancient Egypt. I suppose we should really introduce ourselves. I'm Kieran Toll. I'm from um, the Irish Linen Centre and Lisbon Museum in New York. I'm Sarah Doherty. I work at ver- in various places, but I work at the University of Oxford and uh, I'm a lecturer at the Egypt Exploration Society. And I also, my main job really is I work in developer-led archaeology for Chronicle Heritage, mostly in okay. the Middle East. So what does that involve? Like? So it's exactly how it would be here in Northern Ireland, where if you want to um, change a museum, build a hotel, look at, you know, uh, you're wanting to expand and do a housing development, right. it, everything needs to be checked for archaeology in advance of that. Yeah, okay. It's just part of the planning process in okay. the same way that you would check for great crested newts, right, yeah. veteran trees, um, if there's any uh, weird and wonderful chemicals in the ground, okay. all of those things have to get permits for. Okay. And archaeology is the exact same thing. So um, I write very nerdy reports that nobody really reads right, that okay. are called heritage <laughs> impact assessments. I'm sure somebody appreciates them. Some, you know, it, it pays the bills, yeah. generally speaking. <laughs> but basically it looks at what's, what archaeology is there what are they wanting to do to the site or or study area and what impact would that have upon the archaeology in lots of cases that means total destruction uh, because if you're building a hotel you tend to be digging down into the ground building your foundations and all that Um, but i also look for ways to do mitigation so that might be moving the hotel out of the way of an area that we know is archaeologically sensitive Um, so say if we know there's a medieval cemetery there or we know that there's uh, a remains of an ancient chapel or something like that, then we might go know this sh- that, or we might say, actually, it's too archaeologically important and we don't want this hotel to be built there at all. And we look at other places that uh, it might be possible to do. And you've had success with that? That's, that's worked? Yes, yeah, it does okay, work. Cool. And it's very much a dialogue with the with the client. Um, and and also the local authority. So, you know, that might be Lisburn Council, for example, mm-hmm. you know, or it might be wherever. So at the moment I work a lot in Saudi Arabia and um, they're very much working um, on that very same model where they want to know what, what the archaeology is there. So my company's doing the first surveys, if you like, okay, of yeah. parts of Saudi Arabia that's never happened before. Wow. And then uh, once we get that lovely data, we nerds love a bit of data yeah. and lots of mapping that on, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, computers everywhere. Then uh, I then look at that data and analyze it and say, right, what's there? Is it important? Do we need to do some excavation mm-hmm. there before to find out what's there? And if so, we go ahead and do that. And luckily, the developer pays for that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, I sort of begs the question, um, how do you get into that? Like, How do you get into yeah, that? what's your career path so far? I think it's probably fairly evident on the podcast so far that your accent is local. I'm very yes, yeah. yes. I've kept it, but actually, I've most of my adult life I have worked in England or in Wales, mm-hmm. or I've studied there. So, um, I I started off uh, studying at Belfast High School, and had some great teachers there, and who kind of. I was always very interested in archaeology. I kind of was one of those weird people that knew what I wanted to do from like age very, 11. Very strange, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I think, I don't know if it's, st- I think it's still in the school curriculum, but at P5, you study ancient Egypt and Rome and stuff like that. There's this weird idea that in primary school, you study the Stone Age right the way through to um, to the Roman period. And then you're kind of done with that. Right. And then in high school, you move on to medieval period and you spend most of your time in history class is studying World War Two, one and two. It's very odd, but anyway, in, in primary school, that was I. I got hooked by ancient Egypt okay. at about age eleven, and then I kind of saw that there was nowhere in Northern Ireland or even the South that I could study that. So, I had to go to England, and I managed to get into University College London, um, and studied there for three years. Really enjoyed it. Stayed there for another year and did my masters. And then I kind of wanted to do more. Um, and I got really interested in uh, archaeological ceramics in particular and Egyptian yeah, ceramics because okay. <laughs> they really put the people back into the our understanding of the past. Mm-hmm. So 
even today, everybody has a cup or what they have their their t- their tea or their coffee in the morning. We still eat off of ceramic plates mostly, and the same is true in the past. And we all, you know, that kind of brings that idea of culture, society, what we're eating, how we're eating it. Are we eating it communally? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Are yeah. we eating it separately in our bedrooms, watching YouTube? You know, quite the way that we are. Um, eating and drinking today has changed quite a lot mm-hmm. and the same is true in the past so if you think about our grandparents for example they might have had their their tea in a cup and saucer whereas we are very unlikely to have it that way we would mostly now have our our keep cups or our stanley cups mm-hmm. and the way we are um having our our beverages have changed quite dramatically in the past 50 to 80 years I want to say and it's exact and I was sort of saying it was the exact same thing um in ancient Egypt there's, there's sort of like a window into um how people were living like cups absolutely um, that yeah it just sort of started that and then I was like so how are they making those cups yeah, okay. how, what is the process there um and you know looking in the industrial revolution they fundamentally changed how we uh, eat or you know use our cups and saucers for example because they are poured they use liquid clay and they pour them now into a a large uh, sort of mold and you can make thousands of the exact mm. same cup and saucer um they're absolutely identical and but the the skill is the person who makes the mold mm-hmm. not the person who pours the liquid clay and yeah. anybody can do that so what were they doing in in the past before they made that these molds were designed? Was it the potter's wheel, or was it something else before that? And that sort of got me thinking. Mm-hmm. And my PhD ended up being about the potter's wheel and its invention and its use. Yeah, okay. I'm also very lucky yeah. that my um, uncle Jack Doherty is a very famous potter in his own right. Okay. Um, he's from Port Rush originally. Uh, and now uh, makes the most fabulous porcelain bowls and other items. And I was able to sort of study his process. Oh, well, that's useful. Yeah, okay. And understand <clears throat> how he makes. And then that then allowed me to um, undertake my own experimental reconstructions of the types of vessels that I was seeing in the archaeological record mm-hmm. to try and reconstruct those ancient hands and how they were working and making. Oh, wow, okay. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of how I sort yeah. of the process there, but um, as is often the case, once I finished my PhD, I um I did do a little bit of academic work and I worked in various excavations. I worked for the British Museum for a while and um was lucky enough to dig in Sudan at a an, an Egyptian colony site called Amara West mm-hmm. that was um inhabited around thirteen hundred BC. Uh, for about 200 years and I excavated a couple of houses that was part of this town um, uh, and that would kind of got me kept me going for a little while but um, I kind of realized that I, uh, I wasn't going to get a lectureship role because there weren't many out there mm-hmm. um, so I then uh, worked for a charitable foundation for a little while Um, which promoted mutual understanding between the Middle East and the West. So Mm -hmm. I was able to use my work in Egypt and Sudan a bit. Um, And uh, then I managed to, I was doing a lot of events and sort of programming a lot of events as part of that. Um, And then from then I got a job at the Ashmolean Museum in the public engagement department where I programmed the, the public programming there. Uh, and I in particularly uh, programmed the Museum Lates, which are essentially big kind of festival late nights mm-hmm. where we open up the museum after hours uh, under a theme. And um, yeah, I, I brought in loads of different people, musicians, artists, uh, archaeologists like myself, mm-hmm. but also academics all across the University of Oxford and got them to showcase the amazing research that's going on and seeing how they were inspired by the museum collections. Um, And then unfortunately the pandemic happened and I was made redundant from that. And so then I moved into commercial archaeology. So using my skills as an archaeological excavator, 
Um, and also my well, during my PhD, I got quite interested in ancient buildings and how they were being built and mm -hmm. constructed um, uh, through my excavations in Sudan. But also in, I while I did my PhD at Cardiff University, I worked a lot in Wales on um, 16th century manorial houses and things okay. like that. Yeah, that you just, working, very, yeah. you just get involved <laughs> with whatever is going on. Yeah. Um, and I also, so that kind of led me into developer led archeology, span mm -hmm. mostly in Oxfordshire. Um, uh, and I met my husband at the same kind of time. We were both working at Oxford. And so uh, he's a research scientist, so he's not a humanities person, so he doesn't understand what I do. Right. He, I don't understand what he does, so it's quite good. <laughs> yeah, it works quite well. Um, I was reading an article about you from around 2014, 2015. This may have been that mm. Aswan site you're referring to. Yes. And it was about, um, if I have this right, it was about um, the people who ended up building large monuments such as... Uh, Possibly the pyramids. I'm not really sure. Did I get the wrong end of the stick? Oh, that? um, oh, that's a. I think that's a different site. Actually, so, I think okay. that's in Egypt. I didn't get to mention that one. It's called. Uh, it's a site called Jebel El Silsila, which is an ancient quarry. Right. Um, and it has about a hot. Well, it's not just one quarry. It's uh, several hundred quarries within okay. it. And mm. it's a sandstone quarry where most of the temples of ancient Egypt were kind of birthed from. So there are. I don't know, maybe several hundred temples north to south of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And um, they all mostly were sourced from this one quarry. And when oh. you go in, you can really, it's like it opens up into a huge cathedral like space where these, you know, ancient craftsmen just with copper chisels and wooden mallets um, used their skill and ingenuity to hack out huge blocks of stone from the living rock, then dragged them down on sledges to the the, the River Nile, which was, you know, several hundred yards away, mm -hmm. put those on boats, and then they got transported away to wherever the pharaoh wanted their, their latest temple to be yeah, okay. built or redesigned or what have you. And those were in use for a thousand years so it's, it's kind of crazy it? and so those were like the ordinary folk that were that working there right. you know your soldiers your laborers your stonemasons and your you know so uh and we find there um what it's under the direction of lund university in sweden uh, dr maria, maria nilsson is the director and together with her we find evidence of um his ancient villages um one which dates to the reign of Tutankhamun mm -hmm. and I was able to do that from the ceramics that we saw there I'm the ceramicist for the site uh and also his father Akhenaten uh also uh, had a village you know had the same village and he was building on a monumental scale um he's a really interesting character actually um Tutankhamun's father Akhenaten uh, because he moved the capital of Egypt, which was then uh, around Luxor. He moved it to a site called Amarna. Okay. Um, and he changed the kind of state religion as well of the uh, of Egypt from what was essentially lots of different gods and goddesses to focusing on one main god called the Aten, um, which is sort of represented as a solar sun disk. Um, and he totally transformed all of the political structures, all of the key priests and the kind of equivalents of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. you know, all of those lost their jobs as a result of that. What, why did he do this? What was the reason? I think it was because he was fed up with them telling him what to do because uh, they had a, a lot of sway that's a move isn't it yeah it's yeah. a total move <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, he, he, they had a lot of sway and they knew what they were doing um and i think he was just fed up with all the corruption and the amount of money that they were taking from you know right, okay. to pay for these temples being um you know being manned having um lots of uh they all had their own land so it's a bit like henry the eighth and the dissolution of the monasteries okay exact same thing history repeating itself yeah that's fascinating we, we had alona uh Rajulski from the oh, british yes. museum and ken griffin last year and we both sort of talked we talked to both of them about the idea of um egyptians building large 
different types of funerary monuments. Um, as Arnold was saying, we have really good um, <clears throat> information resources on how these things were built, you know, ledgers and things. And Ken was saying, actually, a lot of the times when people say these could only be built by aliens or something similar, it's because it's on their land. Like, it's, it's, there's a racist element to it, the, the idea that, you know, um, North Africans wouldn't be able to, to, to build these. But you're actually working at one of these sites and you're you're, you're showing how they're, um, they're quarrying and how they're moving large stones and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. You can see the chisel marks. There's um, there's a blacksmith area where we know that, that from all of the copper filings that are littered all around wow, yeah. that they were there redoing the chisels because copper is a very soft metal mm -hmm. and so they probably would have had to have a whole in mini industry going that was just like remaking these chisels mm -hmm. and you can we know we can see from um the quarry um sort of marks and the lines that where they were cutting the the the, the rock how they were doing it they were mostly we think they used the spoil or the kind of rubble of um, of previous quarrying to make giant ramps uh, uh, up against the, the rock okay, so that cool. then they could drag your obelisk, say, your large yeah. um, larger blocks down off of that. And we can see in some of the uh, tomb scenes in that in some cases, some of the tomb owners decided to depict some of these scenes of how they dragged oh, really? wow. the stone. Yes, yeah, there's cool. there's what some in the tomb of Rechmere in Thebes that show um, how they dragged a large uh, monumental statue um, of the king across the, the the land. And what and from some of our experiments that we've been doing there. Um, they may have used wooden rollers, but um, what what we see in the tomb scenes is that they are on a sledge, a wooden sledge, uh, lashed with rope, and then they seem to have uh, sort of beds of reeds or sort of um, grasses, mm -hmm. and they're oiling those in front as the sledge is being dragged. So someone's oiling that as they go and and they're dragging and pulling. And it's maybe only 20 men pulling. So they really knew their physics as mm -hmm. well. They knew exactly what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And they also would have had to have known about ballast weight in boats and mm -hmm. how that is affected and you know, how much um, uh, wind power that they needed. And so, yes, it, it, Ken's absolutely right that to say that they weren't capable of doing that is doing them a massive disservice. Yeah. Um, and we can see that from the quarry. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Yeah, thanks for clearing that up. Um, so you've looked, really a lot of your work has been looking at like everyday life. Yes. In, in from the from these builders, the, these guys who worked in the quarry to the, cer the ceramics. I'm gonna put you in a spot now. <laughs> so in all your work, say if we said to you, um, tomorrow, sir, we want you to start working on an exhibition and you had to pick one or two pieces to be your like, key pieces in your museum display. Mm, that's a tough one. <laughs> I mean, um, what would help tell that story? What, what do you think would be really emblematic of, 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 of the work that you've done? So, well, I, I, what one of the things that I was very lucky enough to find was a very small little necklace that had obviously been dropped at some point in you know in history and it had fallen onto a little sh broken ceramic shirt and um it, it it had two little beads of carnelian and a little tiny bit of beaten gold in the middle and uh, a whole string of beads um, using a technique called faience which is kind of mm -hmm. a step between glass and pottery mm -hmm. um so that to me speaks to and it was sort of curled up as well uh, and so that sort of little human moment like we've all done it we've all dropped something yep. uh and forgotten where it's gone um that would be one of my main ones because it was right in the middle of a of a kitchen mm -hmm. with ovens everywhere and ash and dust and and someone had just yeah forgotten it so that would be one piece mm -hmm. um i'd probably also want to uh, recreate uh, a, a potter's workshop because to because there is a few that we know from especially at Amarna so from Akhenaten's mm -hmm. city there's a few that have been excavated and that as well to me 
um, so you'd have the potter's wheel, the clay supplies, the bench that they worked at, the water supply. So mm-hmm. exactly how it would be. Yeah, the whole setup. The yeah. whole setup as it would as a modern potter would would have it. So that to me would showcase your daily life, and then um, maybe also. Um, things like granaries, so where they would store mm-hmm. their wheat and barley, um, and uh, the sort of farmyard work processing areas, because mm-hmm. that again also would show your daily life. So almost everybody would have had um, their own, um, at least land to access or work. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Uh, or they might have been, um, they're often kind of like serfs as part of a bigger estate, but they would all have their own land to work. Um, so, yeah, I would sort of showcase that as mm-hmm. well and maybe have a scratch plough to show like how it was pulled by oxen mm-hmm. and sort of to reconstruct your sort of average scenes mm-hmm. that um, that we know existed. Um, you know, these kind of cottage industries yeah. that uh, aren't really spoken about so much because you see in... Most exhibitions are your gold, yes. your big pharaoh names, sarcophagus, that, uh, sarcophagus yeah. your mm-hmm. mummies, your big pharaoh names that everybody has heard of, Ramses, Tutankhamun, you know, those those big mm-hmm. superstars, yeah. if you like. But there's so much more to Egypt than, than just those people because yeah. Tutankhamun reigned for, like he was 18 when he died, you know, so he reigned period, seven years. Yeah six years Mm -hmm. um and it's only because uh and he was a really minor king relatively Mm -hmm. speaking but it's just because howard carter in 1922 found his tomb intact Mm -hmm. because it was underneath the rubble of uh the excavations of a later king Mm -hmm. and it was lost if we had found some of the big name pharaohs like ramses ii's tomb Oh, that would have been unreal. Yeah. But his was a minor, he's a minor king. Most of his stuff came from random people's items that then they added his name to. A lot of them are okay. his father's um, objects. Oh, so from other tombs? Other or? tombs. Yeah, okay. Um, because he died so young, way before <clears throat> he was supposed to. Um, what You know, there's a lot of debate still how he died or why. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly uh, he was a, quite a sickly person in life, it seems. Um, but yeah, so for me, it's it's your ordinary folk. Yep. I want to tell their stories. Well, I'm with you. When we put exhibitions on in the museum, I mean, um, personally, I'm not that interested or only slightly interested in what the managing director did. You want to know what life was like yeah. in the mill or in the workshop day to day. I think it because it's... It speaks more to our own experiences. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's really interesting and kind of crucial that we get to that via exhibition. So that's fascinating. Um, So last year we had the British Museum Turing exhibition, Mm. Egyptian Hieroglyphs, Unlock the Mystery. It's a full title you have to give it every time. Of course. Yep. (laughs) And so it was all about decipherment. And it was fascinating. You know, we got to delve deep into decipherment and what difference it it made. Um, So what about your own work? I mean, um, what what did decipherment mean uh, or what does it mean for the work you do now? Do you ha- do you have to engage with it? Um, uh, or is hieroglyphs part of the work that you have to undertake day to day? Well, I have to admit, I was never hugely great at hieroglyphs in university. Um, so I do use I do use it in terms of um, uh, sort of translating basic translations mm-hmm. or I would mm-hmm. I would use it for translating letters I would I would use hieratic more which is a sort of shorthand version yeah, yeah. of hieroglyphs um which a lot of um papyrus was written in rather than um hieroglyphs as such so I'm more interested in the letters between people so at the tomb builders village for example called Daryl Medina on the west bank of Thebes mm-hmm. um most of the people there, around 80%, were literate and they all wrote letters mm-hmm. or lots of them wrote letters and he, and fourteen about 14% of them were women who, mm-hmm. who were writing. And that's really interesting was to me. Was that the big find at the end of the 19th century? Is that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think Ken was talking yeah, about that. Yeah, Ken loves Sterling Medina as well, <laughs> so I'm sure he... Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so uh, in my 
talk this evening I'll I'll show you some of the letters Mm -hmm. and you know a lot of them are gossiping um she did this to me or and he he's not returned this to me I want more ointment for my eyes why haven't you done my laundry on time where where are you why haven't you helped me out it's exactly what we would do now on our whatsapp messages yeah okay so I like that you know rather than your big proclamations that you would get on your hieroglyphs they're a bit dry and not as quite as interesting Uh, yeah yeah. And I don't love all the pyramid text hymns. I find them mm. also slightly, yeah, yeah, a little bit duller. I'm not so interested in that, yeah, so okay. I have to say. <laughs> That's fascinating. Um, so what's what's next then for you? Um, um, well, I'm I'm teaching at the Egypt Exploration Society. So I start a, a five week course in a couple of weeks called Taste of Egypt, uh, where I sort of use my interest in kind of culinary skills and cooking Mm -hmm. and um i'm going to teach all about that and i'll also uh i want the students to have a go recreating some ancient recipes Mm -hmm. and looking at how they bake bread what sort of sweet uh what desserts they had i'll have a bread week and i'm I'm also trying to extract ancient yeast or or yeast from the air and showcase how you would do that or or alternatively you can use your start sardo starters that you've maybe kept going from lockdown (laughs) you know so things like that so um yeah and i i'll also be teaching an egyptian technology course at the university of oxford in April so and they're all online and they can people can engage oh, with me yeah, uh, whenever they like so that's that's how I like to do it because I want to be as accessible as yeah. possible and, really. and then are you back excavating are you... um yes I hope to be uh working um back at Jebel Salsilla in the near future we're f- fundraising at the moment mm-hmm. to uh, we found a lot of tombs in the last few seasons and um we're hoping to uh, get them properly secured and and um, also to uh, help fund our um, work with the local Egyptian workers. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're fundraising for that currently. So fingers crossed we'll get to go there soon. But otherwise, um, I'm working a lot in, in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia and Oman. So hopefully I'll mm-hmm. be going there soon to do some more surveying. So, yeah. Okay, well, thanks for your time today. <laughs> Thank you so much.